Rufus, what got you into social work? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, if someone had asked me years ago, um, because of my own personal background, um, would I consider social work as a profession? And I would have said no. And the reason for that is um, I, I aged out of foster care in Baltimore, Maryland. And um, the last thing in the world that I wanted to be associated with is social workers, kids in foster care, having to have that shame as a child that I didn't have my own parents. And um, so I went through all of high school and my classmates, none of them knew that I lived in foster care. So it had that kind of an impact on me. And um, I, never, I never wanted to uh, identify myself like that. So if I didn't want to be associated with that, I certainly wouldn't want to be associated with what I consider a professional group of people who, as a child, somehow blaming them because I was separated from my parents. And of course, that was absolutely wrong and ignorant on my part. <laughs> but what does kids know? Sure. Um, they know that somebody brought them there. It wasn't their parents and, and, and kept them there. And so I never thought of myself as joining the profession. Um, however, um, and there was a period in my life when I'd graduated from high school and joined and applied and got accepted in the Peace Corps um, and was assigned to Ethiopia and the palace, um, uh, the palace there and, and saw myself going there as a kid who never had been maybe 10 blocks uh, outside of East Baltimore. Um, and I worked for an internship at um, Westinghouse Defense Center as a social scientist, uh, what they call social science engineer. And came in one day and said to a social worker, by the way, who was from California, but a corporate social worker, and was bragging about not in my mind, not bragging, but as I think back, it was bragging about, you know, I just got accepted in the Peace Corps, I'm going to Ethiopia, Halle Selassie's palace, the whole nine yards. And she looked at me and she said, America's burning. And I knew America was burning, but I didn't make the connection between me going to Ethiopia to help a group of people that I didn't know when the place that I actually lived was actually Big Ernie. Was this near the Detroit riots time frame? The same time frame. The same time frame. And so I began to think about that um, and just coincidental, um, I was finishing up my last year at Morgan State College and there were recruiters on campus who were recruiting people for graduate programs. And one of those persons that I connected with in the interviews was a faculty member from the University of Pittsburgh School of Social Work. And I ultimately accepted a fellowship to go to, to the University of Pittsburgh. And, but I, one of the things I was very clear about is I did not want to be a case manager taking children from homes. So I wound up specializing in macro practice, which has to do with systems change and organizational development and somehow changing things that I thought were uh, things that needed to be changed in the name of uh, improving, improving things for mankind. So I fell into it. Um, if you had asked me before, uh, I thought I was going in the military. 
Um, I had already started on a corporate mission of Westinghouse Defense Center. Um, I thought I wanted to be anything but a social worker, but as it turned out in life, that was exactly what I wound up being for the reasons that um, I had to come to grips with. And that reason was um, that I wanted to change things. Rufus, you are very capable, and we have a great story to talk about. Any other uh, academic institutions who you want to give a shout out to, other than Pitt? Well, we've done Pitt, and I, I that was more probably uh, each of my experiences. Morgan State College was an excellent experience. Um, never anticipated going to college. The foster family that I lived with, none of them had probably got beyond junior high school. Um, so I wasn't coming from an environment where academic was stressed. Um, I came from an environment where safety was expressed. And, um, and then I went to Pitt, and then I was coming back home to Baltimore, Maryland, where I lived and accepted in the law school at the University of Maryland, and thought that's what's going to be my next move. Um, one of the dean, the associate dean of the school said to me, what are, you, what are you going to do, Rufus? What are you going to do now that you're graduating? I said, well, I'm going to law school. And then we got to talking. I said, but I don't want to be a litigant. I just want to make social change. And he looked at me and said, well, you don't have to go to law school if you want to make social change. And I said, what? He said, you don't have to do that. And I, what did I know, right? Um, I thought lawyers were everything until I had experience in Ford Motor Company uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, and realized that um, not only were lawyers not the last say about a lot of things, but there were other professions and groups that also contribute. So it was, it was a larger circle, and, and that's where I developed this appreciation for people in media, the people who were able to get messages out, create conversations and those kinds of things. And then ultimately, uh, when the Speaker of the House, the Pennsylvania Speaker, Kayla Roy Urbis, asked me to um, consider staying in Pennsylvania because he thought I had a uh, future, which I must admit, I've never seen that future yet, but it sounded good to a 21-year-old, um, that I wind up going to Penn. And I went to Penn, and I said, well, I have to finish my education. If I don't go to law school, I, I, I got to go somewhere. I got to do something. And he said to me, you can go anywhere you want to go in Pennsylvania. It doesn't matter where you live, as long as you want to work for me. Penn's who brought you into Philly, Rufus? Mm -hmm. Penn? Is right, right. That's, what, that's how I got to Philadelphia. And you stayed. And I stayed. That's right. That's right. So I hope that we, you did accomplish social change, but with the campaign for greater father family involvement. Mm -hmm. But you've done stuff before that. Can you take us through a, a summary of the nonprofit work you did before starting that campaign? Um, but I've, I've had a series of opportunities to do things, and I've always been focused about making systemic change. Um, one of the best experiences I had at Pitt was, was to prepare me. One of the things I liked about Pitt was um, I was frightened. Um, going to a large major university, coming from a small college at the time. But I, I found that the faculty that was there was just outstanding, for one. And their teaching method was so similar to what I had experienced at Morgan. And so it was an easy fit. But more important than that, it helped me to be focused on what it is that I was doing. And I was fortunate enough to have faculty who were experts, experts in doing what it is they were teaching. And sometimes you have faculty who are smart people, but they haven't really done the work. Um, they've read about it. They've written about it. They've advocated for it, but they haven't necessarily done it. Um, and one of the things people have often asked me is the difference between the School of Social Work at Pitt and the experience I had at Penn. And they were very different. But they together, they prepared me for who I am today. And Pitt's training, to me, was more academic 
physically rigorous. Penn's training for me in the School of Social Work was more polishing. The whole approach to teaching was the assumption that everybody there could do this because they've been selected to do it. And so that's when I got involved in the association because the part of the history of who I am, I am currently, as you know, a social work pioneer. But that work as a pioneer and the recognition as a pioneer did not start with Pitt. Pitt gave me my boots to go to the field as a warrior. Is that your master's degree? To my master's degree. Doctorate at Penn. And doctorate at Penn. Undergrad at the other school. Undergraduate at Morgan State. But Penn gave me the coat, the cloak, to walk around with a sense of this can be done because we're capable of doing it. And that's the big difference. And so it's the combination of those two things that have made me who I am today. Tell me about some of your early social work. So one of the things that um, m m my, my experiences as a social change agent began in government, state government in Pennsylvania. Uh, my first assignment as a social work student actually took me to the uh, Catholic Diocese in Pittsburgh. And during that time, there were a lot of organizations that were looking at what we call diversity today. They called it something else um, 20, 30 years ago. And that was looking at trying to deal with the issue of minorities, integrating minorities to mainstream life, mainstream institutions. And so my first experience was that. But my second experience was working for Henry Ford and Ford Motor Company in Dearborn. And that's where I learned the importance of not only lawyers, but the importance of media people and began to understand that in corporate America, media people have a lot of influence. And for me as a student, that was very compelling to understand because it helped to form a different perspective for me. That it's not any one group of people that does anything. It's a collection of people with very specific skills that allowed you to then learn and integrate and how best to use resources that are available to you and to get, appreciate people regardless of the fields of study because everybody had contributed something. You started, uh, you did work at a Philadelphia Workforce Development Corporation. Tell right, and I will, but I wanted to finish up your original question with you, I didn't. And forgive me for it. I jumped too fast. Right. That's a, that's, no, that's no, that's fine. Um, so my experience, the gut of who I am, and why we're having this meeting is my work in the Pennsylvania State Legislature. I worked um, for the majority leader, and then Speaker of the House, Kate Laura Irvis from Western Pennsylvania. Um, the time frame, Rufus. So we have the time frame was. I started with him in the late 70s, no, the late 60s, um, say 68 to 70, something like that. And um, for a couple years before I went on to Penn, because I went to Penn in 1970. And that experience made me unafraid of power. So if you work, as I did, had the privilege of working at a place like Westinghouse Defense Center, which is a major institution in this country, and then have the opportunity to be exposed to a Henry Ford in Dearborn, Michigan, not, not in Detroit, but Dearborn, Michigan, see a whole world and life I knew nothing about, and then come and spend time um, with a majority leader and a speaker of the Pennsylvania General Assembly, I was no longer afraid of powerful people because I began to understand that people are people 
and they are people. And I began to see them through the lens of my social work training as people who have personalities, who have good days, bad days, etc. But I began to learn and appreciate the skills that are necessary to make major decisions and to move people forward, which is where I got my beginning. Um, and my greatest achievement during that period of time was um, the creation of the Department of Aging in Pennsylvania. It was because of that work and exposure and working with aging groups across Pennsylvania when I was working for the speaker that we were able to create a Department of Aging. And I was the key influence of that because most, like most things in life, timing is everything. And it was my conversation with the speaker when the House was about to adjourn that I said to the speaker, we cannot adjourn. And he said, why not? I said, because we need to pass this bill before we leave. And your role was what? My role was his advisor. I was the chief of staff, an executive assistant and chief of staff to the Speaker of the House. A lot of times people now know that staff who develop close relationships with the leaders, whether it's male or female, um, have a lot of influence. And that was the influence. And, you know, to, you know, I could say to myself, you know, I, in, I, I did that. Um, well, I didn't do anything. The members voted. But what I was is instrumental in convincing the speaker to run the bill before they left. And the bill was run, and it passed. And we now have, to this day, a Department of Aging in Pennsylvania. And evidence that the system appreciated that was when the bill was signed, I received um, a copy. I received, the, I received not only a form of the bill and a pen as symbolic of, of that experience, but I was also appointed by Governor Schaap as the co-chair of the transition from a bureau on aging to a department on aging, which was very prestigious as a way of acknowledging without bragging that this person was instrumental in that because it's a, that's a privilege that, that someone bestows on you. And that's how I kind of got started in this and knew that this was something I wanted to do. This being another way of making societal change. Thanks for sharing that. I didn't even know. Again, to emphasize, you weren't a state rep. You were a chief of staff that was instrumental in social change of getting that Department, Department of Aging. Absolutely. Because you said, stop, we're not done our work. That's right. Exactly. And, and I happened to have a speaker who thought enough of me to be guided by that. Rufus, tell me about your work at Philadelphia Workforce Development Corporation. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I, I served um, as senior vice president of the Philadelphia Workforce, Cor Philadelphia Workforce Development Corporation, and I was responsible for um, TANF clients who um, were receiving employment opportunities, training um, to in include to um, what we would say help get families out of poverty by providing skills and jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I did that, maybe ran 12 programs. Um, I moved the, um, increased the revenue for that department. I created a department um, called State, it was a State Transitional Workforce Program. Um, the most significant thing about that was we increased revenue for the corporation from 30 million to 50 million in a year and a half. And that then led to me creating something called the Institute for the Advancement of Working Families. That increase in budget, was that self-sufficient or did you attract that much grant money? Well, I always tell people we were able to do that, not because I'm that smart, but I'm that dedicated. So the state of Pennsylvania provides a lot of money for all kinds of training and programming. Um, 
But there were problems at that time in terms of where the state wanted to go, where the organization was. Because remember, my skills are really macro skills. And so it was right down my alley to be able to talk to state officials to find out what is the problem. Um, the president of the corporation asked me to join the organization because I understood the state. I came out of a state environment, a state political environment. And I said to the Department of Human Services, I want to work. I don't want you to have to come down monthly, weekly, or anything else. We can fix this. What I need to know from you are all of the minutes of the meetings that you've had where there were problems. I will look at that and come up with a game plan. I did that. And what we wind up doing was fixing all of the things that they had problems with. As that was done, what typically happens in government, whether it's the federal government, the state government, or local government, people who are contractors want to work with people who produce. We were able to build a state infrastructure that allowed for the programming that was done there in a way that the state was very satisfied with. And so a part of their message always is about numbers. We were able to document, we were able to do. And after a while, the state then, then began to look at us as having literally done what they've asked us to do, and therefore they began to increase program dollars so that we could expand what we're doing and make sure that other entities were using the same model. How long were you there? How long were you there? I was there, um, say, 99 till maybe about four years, maybe. Um, yeah, about four years. But the key to there, so, so the real story is that was the background for this sure. and the connections. The real work that, that relates to what we're talking about now is the development of the Institute for the Advancement of Working Families. Tell me about that. And that's the grant where I did the first demonstration project for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania dealing with connecting, connecting non-custodial fathers with their children. And I did it as a opportunity to create and develop this organization. But something happened. I fell in love with doing what we call subpopulation work. And I thought you were going to tell me about your wife. <laughs> no, <laughs> you said fell in love. No. no, I fell in love with this work because prior to that, as a social worker, people see social workers as necessarily engaged with clients. I never had a client that was a human being as such. My clients were systems, policy, laws that affect people, serve people, but they were not living entities themselves. This was the first time that I had ever began to work with a population, which is typically called subpopulation, of men around issues that would make change in their lives individually. I've done work that included making systemic change across the board and wouldn't know who those persons are personally at all. But this was the first opportunity. And what made me commit myself to this work was that I had realized for the first time that, one, I could do the work because I had never done it before, one. But two, I was humbled by working with a group of men who were struggling to reconnect with their families, which resonated with me, who grew up in foster care, who did not grow up with his mother or his father. And that was, that was it. This is with TANF? With TANF, with TANF dollars were the dollars that sort of ran that program. And um, What's so- that acronym? Is, is a temporary assistance for needy families. How long were you doing that? We did that for maybe three years. 
uh, a new administration came in because it was a demonstration project. When is that? When are we here? We're now at maybe 203. Oh, this is somewhat recent. Yeah, Not yeah, right, no, yeah. T -t 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 and I w and the new administration came in and had a whole different that mindset. Is that Ridge? No, it was Rendell. Oh, that Rendell? No. Right, right, right. And they had a person, right, they had a person there who was his policy person um, by Donna Cooper who said that essentially TANF dollars should not be used for men. It should be used for mothers and children. And um, so the project wasn't refunded. Fortunate for me, I was recruited by um, the University, Clark, Clark Atlanta University School of Social Work um, and asked to come and be the dean to help them go through their reaccreditation re process. Um, and we did that. And while I was there, one of the things, this in note Atlanta. in Atlanta, Georgia, and one of the things that I struggled with um, while I was there was this itch that I had now to begin to think about this whole work around men within families. That you just did in the TANF, with the TANF project. The right project that I had just come from. And so a colleague of mine in Atlanta um, began to think about this seriously. And in four years I left um, because the school was reaccredited <clears throat> and um, it was time to come back home because I didn't move to Atlanta. I mean, I always used to tell and made some faculty angry. I would say, I'm here on assignment. I don't, I don't, live, I don't live here in Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> and, was that less than a year? Or? No, it was four years. Oh, it was four years, but yeah. you called it temporary. You're right. I mean, you know, and of course people felt like, you know, I remember one person complained that um, he still has Pennsylvania license on his car, you know, because I, n I, never, I never intended to stay. I came, I came to do a job, and, and, and fortunately we did it um, with flying colors. Great. Uh, what year did you come back to? The I think it was like late 207, early 208. Take us to Stonely. That's a good point. Well, fortunately for me, when I left, because we did such a great job, I left with a severance pay. And so my wife said to me, um, just relax, Rufus, just relax. You've been away. And, um, you know, chill for a minute. And... And I did that because, you know, you know, you can get very comfortable uh, when you're working every day and then you're not working, but you're still getting a paycheck. You get real comfortable. And so I did that, um, always looking, but I did that. And then it dawned on me one day that this severance pay is going to come to an end and I need to go find a job. <laughs> and... Um, and I began to find it, began looking and got turned down, got turned down, got turned down, got turned down. Oh, you're too qualified. Oh, I don't know if we could, you know, hire you. All of those things that people say. So um, I had what I call a come to Jesus meeting with myself. And I said to God, um, please help me to decide what the next moves move that I should make. What should I do? And I put it in a context and I said, God guide me to do what if I were a rich man, I would do. Meaning money wasn't a problem because at that time, when you have a family, you're thinking about how you're gonna pay bills, this and that and the other. And that a lot of times people make decisions on that. I was at a point then in life that I didn't necessarily need to do that. What I needed to do is have income coming in because income going out, nothing coming in, you know that's a bad scenario. But what I was saying to my conversation with God was, if I were rich, what is it I should do and not have to worry about money? So that money was not an issue. And what I concluded was, um, the one thing, uh, help me decide actually, help me decide of all the experiences I've had, what should I do? And what I concluded was my commitment to men within families. And f so from that, I began to think about um, how do I connect to the fatherhood community 
the national fatherhood community, not necessarily Philadelphia or, or Pennsylvania even, but the national movement, and began to, um, on my own, make relationships, meet people, and kind of get a sense of, in this period of my life, where, sh where am I going with all of this? So Stonely is a, uh, a group and a foundation that basically allowed you mm -hmm. to do that, do exactly what you think needed to be done. You developed the project, submitted to them, right. and they approved something that you, you knew wanted. that you, uh, you otherwise couldn't get paid to do, exactly. but they recognize the same need right. that you did. And exactly. you, of course, convinced them to do that. Well, I, 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 I think I had some things going for me because Stonely Foundation is work is primarily about devoted to children and at the time clearly devoted to the child welfare system. I came out of the welfare system, so it's kind of, you know, a lot of times in, in the fatherhood work, people will say, what brought you to this work? Obviously, what brought me, whether I recognize it or not, which I do, but if I made like I didn't recognize it, someone would be able to say, you think it has anything to do with the fact that you yourself aged out of foster care? And of course, the answer was, is, is yes. And, but also, for me, it wasn't just out of foster care. It had to do with how I saw and heard messaging that related to men. And because I identify as a male, and at that time a male adult, I was concerned about that. That was the issue that I was literally concerned about. Um, and therefore, wanting to uh, have a sense of what is all this conversation about men and fathers and kind of what, it, what is all of this about? I mean, what is it about? And that was something that I began to think about as a scholar trying to understand that. How long were you at Stonely? Four years. What did you do? Well, I had, I had a, I, my project was called um, The Integration of Responsible Fatherhood Within Foster Care Service Delivery. And why was that necessary? Because one, what we found out, I didn't know at the time, but what we, I now can say something factual. Um, we wind up, what we wanted to do was to explore how do you integrate responsible fatherhood in child and family agencies that get paid with taxpayer dollars to support families. And I was arguing that many of these, these programs, it's not just Philadelphia, this nationwide, that these programs were really focused on mothers and children and not focusing on men who obviously are part of families. You said after four years, um, you learned from your research that it's factual, but you had a hunch before you went in, didn't you? Well, of course, because the literature talked about having um, programming. Well, one of the, the characteristics of our child welfare system is really focused on mothers and children. It's never been focused on, on fathers. But here's what I found that was startling. We had 35 agencies that participated in the project, very respectful Philadelphia agencies, very respectful, large ones, some small ones, um, middle size, but a mixture. Not one of those agencies, not one, had in their mission or vision statement the word father, let alone fatherhood. But they had mothers. Some had mothers, some had parents. They did not use the word father. Now, my macro work tells me when I'm doing consultation or evaluation, if I come to an organization and I look for their mission statement and I'm asking them about something and it doesn't appear in the mission statement, I am not surprised that you can't find it anywhere. But Rufus, you did see parents, but yet you knew there was a problem. Because when we talk about parenting in America, we're typically talking about mothers and children. We're not talking about fathers. And you knew that from experience. I knew that from experience, and I knew it from the literature. More important than my experience, I knew it from the literature, from other scholars. So Stonely really was an informational gathering, 
and a study, but not so much you doing duties to. Um, uh, I wasn't a caseworker, right. right? It was typically what I do, which made it why it was so easy for me to do. So we we after four years we created something called um, three FAs, father friendly flagship agencies. And in 2016, which is the end of the four-year period, of the 35 who participated, we had 25 people that graduated, not people, I'm sorry, 25 agencies that received certification as 3FAs, which was the first of such identification in the United States of America. It was the first time that someone had worked with a group of agencies and taking them through a four-year process where they were, they received initial certification as, as, as anything other than programming, major, for men. This was the first time. And then from that... Well, was this as a result of the... The, the result of our work. Oh, this is the, all of this is part of the Stonely work. So you had partners, too, that you wanted to not, uh, you were doing alone, but you had a project with others. Well, know. one of the requirements that um, Stonely uh, required at the time was that all fellows should partner with a, an agency. They still I, do, right? To my knowledge, they do. Um, my partnering was with Bryn Mawr School of Social Work. I was appointed as a, a, a research associate and working directly with the dean of the school, uh, da Darlene Bailey. Um, and so the idea was um, to take advantage of my academic background as well as uh, my practical experience, life experience, professional experience to do the project. So it, it combined, like all of the work we do when we get to this, our symposiums always have an academic perspective to it and a practice perspective, because research um, supports practice and practice informs, informs. Research informs practice and practice informs research. They go together. But the, the other thing that is important, I think, that came out of that work was of the 25 people who sort of graduated in 2016, 17 of them petitioned the Strong Families Commission, which was another byproduct of my Stonely work, um, asking for accreditation. Of that 17, 12 of the agencies wound up being accredited in 2018. And that was the first time anywhere in America that there was an accreditation of a child and family agency as a father-friendly flagship agency. And we use the word flagship because the participants in this study never received a dime for four years of work. They were engaged because they believed, even though their mission or vision statement did not use the word father, they understood the importance. And so in that sense, they were heroes so and they were flagships. When you say participants, you mean those agencies? Those agencies, right. correct. That's, that's right. So... Tell me about the formation and the beginning of the campaign, what the, the, the commission and the, the, the group that did the campaign for greater father family involvement. Well, first of all, I want to want to say that I was disappointed um, that the city of Philadelphia did not embrace the work that we had done. Um, the, although we had be specific when you say city. How do you mean? City government. The yeah. Government. City government. So. Yeah. Um, there was, in the, the beginning of the project, there was support from the Department of Human Services endorsing the project. And that state? No. City of Philadelphia. Part of them. Right. Keep going. Thank yeah. you. Yes, yeah, that's fine. Uh, it was the, the, and we got endorsements from them. But typically, there, it, Stoney has projects that are either internal to, to the system that you're trying to change and those that are external. My project was not internal. It was external, which is how I like to work. And so what, we've, what we wind up having is, even though they endorsed the concept, because I was never really a part of 
the government doing it, it never got, in my opinion, the attention it might have gotten if I had been a part of the government doing it, if that makes any sense. Sure. And so one of the things that we realized after four years of work and 35 agencies participating, we said something is not right here. And that if we, if the government is not ready, um, I, I raised the, um, the issue with the managing director at the time and, and made a plea for there to be some recognition on a, by the city of Philadelphia to recognize the work that these agencies had done. Because I come out of government and I knew that there are times when we actually fund projects and don't necessarily get what it is that we thought we were going to get. Here was a situation where agencies received nothing and did everything we asked them to do, and they didn't get any recognition. I was not pleased with that. And so the managing director um, at the time, when we, when we had the ceremony, came to thank the agencies. That was the greatest, that was the highlight for me, because I got the city administration to recognize publicly at the and we did it at the library, main library in Philly, the importance of what they had just done. Because it's important for, um, to reward people for when they're, you know, when you ask somebody to do something, they don't have to do it, and they do it, I think they deserve to be acknowledged. And the city ultimately acknowledged it, but it never gave them the funding that they thought they might receive to expand their current agencies to begin to do this work. So from there, I decided that if we're really serious about this, we have to take this conversation to the state level. That's where we have to go. Because the issue is not about Philadelphia. The issue for me is about Pennsylvania. And from, from, as a result of that, we started in late 2016 and traveled over the Allegheny Mountains to Pittsburgh, where there were groups there who had been working consistently in this area for a period of time. And there was something there called a, a colleague of mine in the uh, in NFI, the National Fatherhood Initiative, said, there's a group out there that you might want to meet with. And and I said, really? I didn't know that. And he said, it's called the Fathers Collaborative Council of Western Pennsylvania. And so... That council, Rufus, we were in Pittsburgh together. Mm -hmm. The day before the event started, there was recognition of a group of people. Was that the Fatherhood Council of Pittsburgh? Or Western Pennsylvania? The, the group of people were, it's, it's not the Fathers, it's the, the Fathers Collaborative Council of Western Pennsylvania. Right, and I post a video of those right. people being recognized. That's right, yes, yes. And, but the real group, the, 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 the root of their work is tied to something called the AIU, which is the Allegheny Intermediate Unit, which is a part of statewide programming in Pennsylvania that comes out of the Department of Education. And so this group made it possible for the Collaborative Council to have a place, a collective place to meet and to have conversation and to host me as a visitor at the meeting, the first meeting we actually had that talked about starting a statewide network. When you say you went over there, do you mean like a weekend or a week or did you live there for a time? I lived there years before I went back for this. At Pitt, University of Pitt. I was at Pitt, right. So when you went back for this, were I you residing or were you visiting? I was visiting. For how long? A day. Oh, so you really had intensive interviews and discussions. Went out, talked about it, and in fact, what we... Of course, I was a stranger to, to the people there, and people are suspect, which rightfully so. Um, but I was compelling in the argument. They didn't know me, but they understood what I was saying. And they also understood that they, by themselves, in Allegheny County, 
one of 67 counties alone probably wouldn't be able to do what they would like to see done by themselves. And they were smart enough to know if we do stick together in the West and we can work with this guy from the East, we have the beginning of a movement in Pennsylvania. And you take this day to be of great significance. Rufus, how did you set this up for other people who want to start a statewide movement? How did you... I think you have to go with a vision. You have to go with a vision. You have to go with a story. You have to go with the facts. Remember, the people we met with were doing, quote unquote, fatherhood work in social service agencies. And these are people who knew that they didn't have the resources they would like to have to serve the people they were serving. And also remember, in 216 in Pennsylvania, fathers or fatherhood was not a conversation that was readily had. So they saw and understood what I was talking about and had the desire to want to move forward. That's, that's really the key. It's sort of like if you meet somebody and you influence them to do something, you're foolish if you think it was just you. They already had the idea. What they saw was an opportunity. Rufus, I want you to know what I hear is that you only spent one day, but you arranged something, you went over and you had a discussion with such a large group of people. People, I'd like to have a second interview where we talk about how to start a movement or how to complete a movement and do you know, a blueprint of everything that you did. I want to hold that thought and do that in another one, but I want to incorporate it by reference because people yeah, sure. will be able to see the link right. of us talking about here to find the other discussion, right. but I want to stay focused on this right. campaign. I got you. All right, so then what did you do after We that? then began to meet in Harrisburg because one of the things that I thought was absolutely necessary is um, if we're going to do a statewide, that's, this comes from my experience in state government, if we're going to do a statewide movement campaign that we need to move the, we need to move our residency, if you will, to the center of the state. We need to be in where the action is. And the action in Pennsylvania is in Harrisburg. And so we began to meet, come from Pittsburgh, a group of people, come from Philadelphia, a group of people, and we began to talk and have meetings in Harrisburg about how do we move this agenda forward. And one of the things that we decided was, why not have a statewide conference? And the purpose of the statewide conference was it's evident in what we defined it as and it called it. It was called Child Well-Being in Pennsylvania and the Urgent Need for Father Involvement. And that was the first of six annual conferences that we had starting in 217. And the purpose of the first conference was to, to begin to educate people about the importance of what research already knows, and that is fathers make tremendous contributions to the well-being of children. First, the first one, 2017, was that Mechanicsburg? That, that was held in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. And so what's the second one? Well, they both first two were. The first two were held in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, the second one dealt with most people in social service know that the systems are um, don't necessarily work together. They operate in silos. And so the second conference in 2018 really was about uh, father, child, and family advocates. People who, this is a generalization, but I think it's on solid ground, fatherhood programs don't necessarily interface with family programs or child and family. Those programs typically are working to enhance the development of men to find the skills and then sometimes even the carriage to be involved in their, in their child's life if they had not been in the child's life. Children's, most children programs is really about 
child welfare, meaning um, safety, permanency, and well-being. Not necessarily fathers or mothers. It's that. And then when you talk about family programs, you're really then typically talking about education, some other areas where families are looking at the family. Um, and that family may or may not have um, fathers as a part of it. Most of the social service work that we do, uh, the fathers are, are often not a part of the, the, the residential family. They may be in and out, but not necessarily there every day. Um, the third conference that we had in 2019 um, was in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And there was another, there was something that happened before then that I want to cover. Uh -huh. Was that you went in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. you met with the Fathers Collab Fatherhood Collaborative. No. Fathers Collaborative Council of Western Pennsylvania. You met with them, mm -hmm. and the first step was let's have annual symposiums. So you had these first two. Well, but the good news about that is we were so pleased to get another group that was interested in helping to do this. We actually only thought we were going to do it one time. Nobody had a vision that six, seven years later we would be doing this. We, had, we were doing it because I knew a part of what I discovered in my research at Stonely was Pennsylvania, which is in Region 3, the Administration for Children and Families. At that time, Pennsylvania was the only state that you could go to the internet and find nothing about fathers. And so as a person who had adopted Pennsylvania as their home, I said, this is ridiculous. We need to have a conversation about fathers and the importance of fathers in the lives of children, families, and communities. And that's how we did it. So we really were only willing to do this, just to do it so that that could never be said again. But after the second one, a decision was made with you and others that you connected with. Tell me what happened with the launch of the SOC. The SOC was a part of the beginning. So SOC was formed when I made the, when I made the run, if you will. SOC existed, but SOC was not statewide. When I went, when, when I went, um, and SOC means it's the Pennsylvania Symposium Organizing Committee. Sure, we're using here after. Right, right. Let's let other people right. know well, what we're talking know. about. So SOC existed as a part of the Stonely Project. It, it began um, with the, it's, well, actually SOC actually began in 2014, before the Stony Project ended because a part of what we created was the Strong Families Commission. So wait, the, the, the symposium organizing commi committee or commission wasn't what did the first annual? It's something different. Oh, no, right, exactly. Okay. Right. The first conference, a part of the, the my project with Stonely was very different than typical projects because it had multiple dimensions. And one of the things that we did in 2000, uh, the first thing we did itself in 2014, we did a study in Philadelphia on uh, fathers, uh, what we call child well-being in Philadelphia, um, profiles of fathers, children, and families. And we did this report with, this, we did this, we released this report, and the report had recommendations. One of the recommendations that we recommended was to create a statewide entity to do this work. With Stonely, this happened? Not with Stonely. It was a product of the work I was doing as a Stonely Fellow. What year was that published? Um, 214. Right. Okay. And so that's before the end of the project. So midway the project, we created, that we had this report. And in the report, we recommended that there be a statewide, not, not a statewide, but there be a Philadelphia entity that would go on beyond the project. And the statewide one came after, after you that. that Pittsburgh. That's right. Okay. That's exactly so right. So take me to the launch, what is it, then the Strong Families Commission. The Strong Families Commission was the commission that would be the entity to begin in Pennsylvania advocating on behalf of fathers within families.
Who joined you in forming the Strong Families Commission? There were a number of people. Um, there was two sets of people. There was a group of people who joined as founders, some as members, and some ex external. So, for example, uh, Dr. Wilson Good, former mayor of the city of Philadelphia, joined as an outsider, a person who was doing his own work around Amachi that talked about um, serving children of incarcerated parents. So people were drawn to this work depending on what angle they were coming from. Um, he came because he was doing this work. He understood the connection of the work. We then had a, another uh, leader of, who's recently passed, uh, David A. Wire, who was the founder and president of um, Delta Community Support, whose work was around children and families with disabilities. May God bless uh, his soul. Yeah, may God bless his soul, that's correct. Who was a great contributor to two, those two men were the beginning leaders of SOC. SOC was created by the Strong Families Commission with those two men as the leaders of the SOC and with the Strong Families Commission literally being the foot soldier going across the Allegheny Mountain to meet. So when did they join now? In 2014 or they, 2019? 2014. Oh, the SOC. Okay. No, but you, the leader, I meant the other leaders. Did they come the, in well, 19 or 14? The other leaders came for the sets of leaders okay. because when we went in 216, Allegheny County became a leader. But before then, in 214, we had the SOC. And you had... Then when we got to 19, you had David Wire and Dr. And, Good in 1014, 14. Yeah, they they were the backdrop. They were the backers, if you will, and supporters of encouraging me when I had to say, "Does this make sense?" They were the men who said, "Yes," and we support you, which gave me the courage and the conviction to go forward, because. I had met with, there were some other people who had a vision that this is important to do. So we went. So in 14, when we created SOC in City Hall, by the way, then the mayor's reception room is when SOC was born and signed with the co-founders of the organization. So then who did you pick up in 2019 as partners? In 2019, um, the most significant partner that we picked up um, was Dr. Joel Myers, um, who is the founder and the CEO of AccuWeather, and who himself had independently um, formed, created, and supported with a board of directors an organization he named as the Dad's Resource Center in Center of Pennsylvania. And Center County, Pennsylvania. Center County, Pennsylvania. And one of the things that we wanted to do, because this is a part of how, how do you make things happen, is to highlight, we wanted to show the magnitude and the diversity of men and women who saw this as an issue, one. And so David Wire suggested that um, we need a spokesperson. These both men were, you know, busy. They didn't see themselves as the spokesperson. They saw themselves in the roles they play as chair and vice chair of the SOC. But they wanted a, a face. Both persons you're referring to, Dr. Good and David Wire. That's correct. And Rufus Lynch. Well, they wanted me to be the face. And I rejected that. And I rejected it because when you look at the population in Pennsylvania, and I'm an organizer, and my argument with them was 
we need a face other than my face if we're talking about changing Pennsylvania. And I said, um, we need a successful person who everybody in Pennsylvania can recognize the, the success of this person. Um, and as, as known as I was in my field, um, I wouldn't say I was that person. And so we wanted someone who was successful by American standards, Pennsylvania standards, someone who was educated. Dr. Myers has served and still does 33 years at the time on, on Penn State Board of Directors. Um, he's an international business person, um, had so many things going for him um, that we all kind of look to and, and say, yeah, that's a solid person in America um, that we feel, why is he in this? What does he have to say about it? Um, because one of the things we've always argued about is that this work in Pennsylvania cannot be, cannot be about poverty and black and brown people and fixing them. That this work is about all Pennsylvanians, it's about all fathers with children, and we needed a face that represented that. Top, population in Pennsylvania at the time was at best 12%. When you, when you look at the population of people of color who are African Americans, I'm an African American. I'm not the face of Pennsylvania. There are other faces of Pennsylvania, but I'm not the face of Pennsylvania. And Dr. Myers joined us because he had his own story about why this work was important and to him. To summarize, it's not a Philadelphia welfare story. It's a national issue. It's a national issue with a state relevance to it because it's about, and when we talk further, we'll see, not only did we believe it, but other people believed it too at the end. Thanks for clarifying that. Now, uh, tell me about the September 2019 symposium, the third one in Philadelphia, who we met in September. Right. That, we had, the first two were about educating people and bringing them together. These are basically professionals. A lot of times people will ask us, well, do you have uh, men there who've gone through the programs and things? I said, no, that's not our target population. Our target population was the government. The second target population were the professionals that do the work. And we wanted them to understand the significance of this because research has shown the biggest problems of dealing with um, integrating service to fathers is the professionals. And many of them, and this is, you know, you know, we're not being mean to them or anything, but many of them, like any profession, they join a field because they think they're going to be doing A, B, and C. Many people join child and family agencies because they want to help children or help families. They didn't join this to work with men because a lot of reasons. One, they have their own baggage about men. Two, they have not been trained to do this. Three, the system it doesn't train them to do this. There's no space for them because remember, historically, what we're talking about when we talk about this, we're talking, regardless of the language we use, we're talking about mothers and children. We're not talking about mothers and fathers and children. We're talking about mothers and children. And so to ask a worker to who could be spent all their career doing something, or they're new. They chose this work because they think what they want to do it, they, they have something to say, and they, it's comfortable for them. That's very, very different than working with a population that is not integrated into that system. The system doesn't really know how to work with men, and neither do they. And so, one of the things that, so that was what the first two was to educate people. But the third was really about um, child, child, early childhood development and the role of fathers. Because then we wanted to transition from the education. We were convinced by this time. Now remember, in 217, we thought we were finished. People wanted more. So by the time we, the third year came around, we really then wanted to begin to talk about the things they wanted to talk about, and that is the individual role of fathers. 
specifically, not so much the systemic roles, but the individual roles. And um, we had that in Philadelphia, which was the largest turnout. I think it was like 300 people there. Um, that was held in, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That was wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, Who's there to see Dr. Myers? The Myers, the, the news, I think it was ABC was there to do uh, a taping of his speech and et cetera. Um, and it went very well. 2020, well, I don't need to tell anybody what happened in 2020, but uh, COVID was the, the, the catch me out during that period of time. And so most people were not having, excuse me, face to face interactions around conferences. It's usually virtual conferences. And I think this is one of our best products. Um, we did six hours of taping and over two hours a week for three weeks. And the purpose of that was so that people in the United States or wherever, uh, wherever they could pick this up, could see what it is that we were talking about. And it included legislators, um, agency representatives from different disciplines um, talking about, and men talking about, and women talking about their experience and why they think men are important to the lives of children and families. We even had as a principal speaker, Dr. Uh, Wade Horn, who was very instrumental in the beginning movement in America uh, through the Bush and I think it's um, uh, Clinton administration. He was a secretary, undersecretary in both of those administrations and responsible for helping to put together the National Fatherhood Initiative. Dr. Lynch, I have to tell you, 2020 was, um, I agree with you one of the best. However, uh, Wade Horn actually, I remember him vividly, was in 2019. He was great. He was live. Yes. I remember his speech. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. You're right. It was. He was too. No, yeah. but your point was right. taken about 2020 right. was strong. That conference. Right. Uh, the three weekly, two hour. Right, December. right. But I, um, before COVID. But what, what we had in 2020 is that we had legislators, two senators, two representatives, that spoke about why the 219 press conference and the bill was so important. And the bill actually was all set to go in 2020 until COVID had its own plans. Mm -hmm. But I remember vividly that we were meeting weekly or bi-weekly. We were meeting regularly, regularly. through Zoom right. and we had all plans to go with uh, launching one of the um, iterations of the bill, right. and uh, it was COVID was put that all on hold. Right, but I, even with that, I'm glad we did that because it created uh, a piece of history that all of what we did in 2020 is in there. The whole piece is there. Now, we typically always provided what we call program booklets. The program booklets are all summaries of what happened and in some instances, um, the entire statement that the speaker might have made, etc. I'm a, I'm a it's sort of a history buff in a, a buff in a way. I like to be able to see the change. It's a part again of social change. The steps in the process. Each thing that we did had its own purpose and its own meaning, and we tried not to do something that we had already done. And so far, we've done that. Every conference we've ever had has had a different theme. So after COVID kind of lifted, 2021, things started to go or take off? Two significant things happened in 2021. One, we got the Department of Human Services, the Bureau of Child Support Enforcement, to adopt a Father Family Advocates Advisory Board, the first of its kind in the United States, housed in Pennsylvania. And the second thing that happened was the Bureau, we were the first, we being the commission, and I'll, I'll say the commission, because the commission was the only legal corporation for them to partner with. Specifically, what commission? The Strong Families Commission. And we were, the, we, so that was the first time that the state government 
Bureau of Child Support Enforcement had partnered with a citizens group. So those two things made all the difference. Now, interesting enough, the persons who participated in 21 felt that that was the best conference for them. And that was because I think because of the nature of the topic, those who came were really interested in that and they received tons of information. April 2021 in Harrisburg, right? Yes. That was a one day event. Oh, oh, no, it was a day and a half. Two, well, the night, the, before, the night before, before it, right. The next that's exactly correct. And that's when we gave an award to uh, Representative Magorski, who was the sponsor of the bill, uh, the last version of the bill um, in 2021. And we recognized her for her consistency and commitment to the work and the bill. Take us to 2022, this year. 2022, uh, we were so fortunate to have Western Pennsylvania to be the host of the conference. Because the idea has always been, it, the, the work is not about the sock in and of itself, it's not about the commission or PetFix, which was the campaign. It was really to get those around the state to begin to pick it up. And so, rightfully so, um, the first to pick it up was the original first partners, statewide, and that was the AIU and the Fathers Collaborative Council of Western Pennsylvania. And the title was Cultivating Connections Across Systems. That's good. And it was a great title because that's exactly what we had to do, cultivate connections. So a big part of this, Rufus, was the, the law that you wanted to get passed. Please tell us about that. Well, there's two versions of that. Version meaning in terms of moving one to the other. When we did the original bill, which we created, we being the SOC, I mean, the, the commission. Let, let me just make up, because that's going to be confusing to people. The Strong Families Commission was the entity, the engine, if you will, that created the two things that really people were most familiar with. One had to do with the SOC, and we talked about how that started. And the purpose of SOC, and the 10 purposes, which I won't go through, but the purpose of SOC was to bring to the attention of Pennsylvanians the fact that there are too many children or too many fathers who, are not, who were not engaged in the well-being of their children. Period. It was to bring that to their attention. Sure. And the second thing, we can go back into one if you want, but give me right. the second too. And, and which second? You said there's two things. Right, right. One, you just gave Oh, and the, and the, second, second. the second group is the Pennsylvania Greater Father Family Involvement Campaign. So we did it in steps. So we started from sort of an academic base, the research. SOC did not do research. The campaign did not do research. The research and the organizing of the research was led by the Strong Families Commission. The SOC served as the network, building a network where people could come together to plan and attend symposiums about subject matter. So it was an educational device. The, the pet figures is called was the campaign where the direct targeting, if you will, of legislators took place. So there was levels to this thing. One, who's, who's, who's got the plan for this? That was, the, that was the commission. Two, who is a, what's the apparatus that's gonna pull people together across the state? The commission never pulled people across the state. The commission created the SOC. The SOC pulled people across the state. The SOC, I mean, the commission also was responsible for putting together the apparatus for the campaign. However, the three groups worked together, but the only legal entity was the Strong Families Commission. And there's another collection of uh, a professionals network it still has potential if people want to take that up. Right. And they can still, you know, any professional involved with fathers and families can still join the network and make something of that potentially. Right. 
All right, Rufus. Well, they, the, we have to say that when the bill passed, and I know you asked me to say something about the bill, but when the bill passed, the campaign was finished because it was phase one, and so was the SOC. So the where we are now is in phase two, which we'll talk about when you're ready. But phase two becomes the apparatus that you're talking about. Yeah, we're ready. Let's right. do it. Okay. So a part of, of phase two, the first thing I believe in, that history needs to be tracked. So if I say SOC, we had a meeting the other day and someone said, this is the new entity that has grown out. It's a spinoff of SOC. It's called SOC Commonwealth Citizens Council. And someone, one of the members says, I thought SOC could kind of go on away with phase one. I say, they have. That means, that stood for the Pennsylvania Symposium Organizing Committee. That was the agreement. I said, however, we use the, ser the term SOC now so that the public realize there is a connection of the work. So it's SOC, but it's Commonwealth Citizens Council. We've never had a citizens council. We've had people who were leaders, professionals, educators in the field, who too are citizens, but they weren't necessarily functioning. I haven't mentioned a citizen without a context of some organization. The new entity for phase two of what we're doing are citizens. So we won't be talking about who, where they work, where they come from. We're saying that the, to do suc successfully phase two, we're talking about organizing individuals in all 67 counties of Pennsylvania. And this is going to go parallel to the law that we discussed. The, pur the purpose of this group of people is to support the work, the specific mission in the bill that the Pennsylvania Joint State Government Commission has been asked to perform. And let's talk about the bill. I, I thought the bill was, um, tell us about the, the, the precise function of what the bill establishes. The, the bill establishes a advisory committee. That's the most. And that's the difference between what the first version of the bill was and the last version. The first version of the bill called for an independent commission. Through the negotiations in the House and the Senate and the Republican Party, Democratic Party, we came to closure that if the purpose of the bill is clearly articulated, and I was I had talked to a lot of lawyers about this, and they all said the same thing. It's not so much what you call a bill, it's what the bill has is, is defined to do. Sure. That's the issue. It's not what you call it, it's what it is that they're doing. I was satisfied with that. An advisory committee. Committee. So the bill, the bill, the committee itself was housed in the Pennsylvania Joint State Government Commission, which is a prestigious committee. Uh, commission for Pennsylvania because it's the research arm of the General Assembly. All right, let's talk about its function now. All right. So its function currently is to do what we call, they don't call this this, but I call it in my field, an environmental scan of fatherhood, child and family matters in Pennsylvania and issue a report to the governor and the General Assembly as to the status of children, fathers, and families in Pennsylvania. How do we do this? What's the issues, if there are any issues? And sort of um, kind of give an official uh, position. What, what the General Assembly acted on was not so much professionals, but advocacy on the part of professionals, parents, etc. It now turned it over to its research arm. Well, Rufus, you at least gave them a head start with what you did at Stone League for Philadelphia, right? I, not only that, but we also, in 2018, produced a 112-page document that did an a analysis of 10 systems in Pennsylvania. We never talked about that yet. So they, they we did... 2018. 2018. All right, you bring that up when you want. Just, right. You want to but because this... Talk, this I'm going to ask you about that next. Right, okay. So, so my point was... 
um, th they had to do their own. You know, the, you know, think about it. So the, the government, government, the, the go government has to do its own. Right? That's correct. The government, this, and I think it makes sense. At first, I, 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 I had some pushback, but then I thought about it. I said, you know, if their researchers confirm what we already know, they're more likely to embrace this work. And do something about it. And then it. do something about it. They're more likely. And part of what and you're talking about is funding, or at least making sure funding goes to including fathers. That's really what we're talking about here. Well, yeah, you, you cannot, the system will not absorb fathers and service delivery without money. I mean, so, but we never talk about money. And I don't talk about money because then people take that as a basis to say we can't afford it. I try to get people to understand the importance of fathers because that's the most important thing for people to see the value of it. Most of what people hear and perhaps maybe see doesn't necessarily show that by itself. But people do are aware, as we saw when they voted unanimously over and over and over again. All right, so let's make an important point here, Rufus. We can talk about more of this in the other interview that we were discussing, but you, I, I kind of, you kind of recognize the need for money to go in a certain place, but that's not how you started to try and get it. You had to start with educating people. You had to first. educate people, right. And we still don't talk about money. The Appropriations Committee talked about that, but that's their job. It's so easy for people to get off focus and things move in different directions. We still, you've been around us enough, you never hear us talk about money. We talk about the transformation of agencies to include fathers in service delivery. Implied in that is that you're going to have to give money to do that because agencies have to change. So they have to have experts to do that. They have to train to do that. But they, they ha may have to take a room that was a cafeteria room and, and put a training room in. I mean, who knows what they need? But the bottom line is, in order for this to be successful, there needs to be resources either rechanneled or you need additional resources because you're talking about serving more people and a different population. So Rufus, again, let me, um, let me restate or summarize. In 2003, you recognized the need for greater father family involvement and a problem with agencies. But instead of asking for the money right away, we've been on a two decade campaign for you to educate people before you knew the money would come. The first goal of the campaign, the Pet Fit campaign, is raise the consciousness of Pennsylvanians. That's the first goal. And as we move forward in phase two of this, guess what? It's still the first goal. It's still the first goal. Because, and I have been encouraged because I see it moving. I see it moving around the country. What has not happened, unlike many movements, there's been no shock which pull it all together. Um, people are here, people are there. I, I tell a story that I'm, I'm proud to tell because it tells the story. I did, it helps me tell the story without me telling the story. It's that I tell people, especially in some who, in, when I'm driving around the country or even, I said, I ask people they know something called um, City Line in Philadelphia, for example. Some people know if they're Philadelphia, they've heard of it. Some them. City Line, you mean the main line? Yeah, I mean main line, I'm mean, sorry. Yeah, main line. line, I'm sorry, yeah. I, mean, I live off the of City Line, so that's what you, but main line. And there's this white woman who walked up to me, I was at some event, and she whispered to me, uh, Dr. Lynch, um, please continue your work. Well, I don't know, I don't know from a can of paint. And that's all she said. And I, I know it from a can of paint? What I said, say? I didn't know her from a can of paint. Okay. I mean, I didn't know her. And I would ask the audience, why do you think she said that? And people would give answers, and of course they were never the right answer. And I said, she said that because she knew exactly what I was talking about, which makes the point that I've been making for years, that this issue 
is not just about poor people and black and brown people. This is an issue that Americans experience and know something about. And I said, well, so that's what she meant by keep up the work, because she understood what I was saying. But I said, why was she whispering? And they didn't know the answer to that either, and I don't either, but I suspect that it wasn't safe to talk about this for her. This is not a conversation that um, many people, especially people who are well off, are comfortable talking about. Um, you're familiar with our logo, and the logo, our logo is a turtle, and, and it says, sign of the risk taker. And people have asked me about that. And I said, they said why, why did you do that? I said, because talking about men within family is risky business. It's a subject that people are uncomfortable talking about for a lot of different reasons. And our role has been able, has been to talk about it so that people feel comfortable talking about it. Rufus, you know what we're talking about. I know what we're talking about. But, but look, for someone who is just watching this for the first time and learning about this, it, risky business, is, is it because of the, the, the current pro-woman, the feminist, or anti-domestic violence that you say that? Is that why? Is I that think why? that's one reason, not all the reasons. So if you live in a middle-class suburban home, and you may not talk about this because these kinds of things are not supposed to happen here. You know, you see things on TV and something happens, somebody just gets shot or something happens, somebody gets robbed, and you see people say, oh, this is not supposed to happen in my neighborhood. You know, I remember once someone asked me, uh, where should they live in uh, Philadelphia that's safe? And I said, there's no place that's safe. Things happen all the time. Sometimes they happen more frequently in other places than other places. But it's only when they happen to you where you don't think they're going to happen that you're shocked. And that so you have to be careful wherever you are is the point. So it's not just, it's not just about women. In fact, I say to men all the time, the problem that men think that they have with women is not the problem. The problem is not women. The problem is men who have not decided to engage the system that they're in, period, and become active in that system. They get, because the system is not working on their behalf. And that's what we've got to change. But it's not about women. Women have their own issues. And I've written about this. They have their own issues for, for the issues they're concerned about. But women support what we're doing. They support what we're doing, period. The person who did our bill, it wasn't a man that did the bill. It was a woman who did the bill. So then, but I do want to articulate this and not leave it to subtlety. When you say it's risky business, is part of the risky business admitting that there's a huge problem? That's the overall issue. Okay. But it's not women, and that's the point I want to make. Because well, risky business, Rufus, this is really what I want to focus. It's risky business because to to follow this work and believe in it, you have to recognize there's a huge problem. That's correct. But what I'm saying is we would be doing a disjustice and put playing into what we constantly always are doing, we being America, um, blaming and pointing fingers. This work is about parenting. And it's about, I have, I'm a father and a grandfather. I've had to adjust, just like every other man in America, to the change and the transformation of women in this country. When I was a young man, we called women Mrs. or Miss, M-I-S-S. -S. Through my lifetime, we now call them Ms. I had to adjust to that, or not. But I'm comfortable adjusting to it. When I was raised with Ms. Yeah. And Z, and that Ms. That's right, the same. Raised that way. That, they're raised that way. So it, this is no different than anything yeah. else. Women have a right to be free, citizens, active, educated, etc. Men have got to figure out how do we do, how do we parent together? Parenting, more and more men want to be close in the lives of their children. We see it all the time. One of the things I liked about Representative Mogorski 
in her, her statement she made in 2020 in the video. She said she's married, three children. Um, she admitted publicly that she had to step back and allow her husband when they were having problems, I want maybe problems not the right word, when, when there were issues with her younger child, she had to step back as a woman and let him interact with the child because that's what the child needed and he needed that too. And so it's really about, we're not at odds, I'm not at odds, I've been, I've been divorced. I'm not at odds with anybody. I'm only wanting to figure out how do we get to a situation where we're not at odds. All right, I want to bring this home, Rufus, if I could. You mentioned that the law was supposed to, that the, uh, the, the, the committee is going to issue a report. The law authorizes the committee to issue an advisory report. When can we expect this? It's required by law by December 2023. Okay. What would be the next step at that point? What would you anticipate? What do you expect to occur? Well, the next step at that point, hopefully, is there's a clear scenario as what the Joint State Government Committee would recommend to the government for the next steps, i.e., do we need an independent commission? That's the, that's the question. If we need it, what do we need it for? If we need it, where do we put it? If we need it, how do we fund it? All right, and Rufus, now, that's at the end. I know this from talking to you. This is actually was the first uh, iteration of the bill, or the first idea of the draft of the bill. So, uh, based upon your research and what you were predicting or fighting for. What, what are the answers to that question? Because we've discussed this well, at meetings. Right. I'm going to hope and pray that they get it right. <laughs> I'll start there. But, but let's, well, I'm, I'm going to go there, but that's the key thing. Because sure. we don't have any... See, the mistake that we make when, when interacting with government, people or, or any authority, people think they have authority they don't have. The, the, it's clear that the General Assembly is going to make a decision. So... I actually want to help phrase this okay. because... If they don't get it right, let's, but I want to ask this a different go way. Ahead. What do you want to see for Pennsylvania? What, where should we go? That's my question. The question, we're not going anywhere anytime soon if they don't have the right recommendation. And people need to accept that. Let me ask you this way. Go this ahead. Time, what would your recommendation be? My recommendation, there you go. My recommendation would be, yes, there's a problem in Pennsylvania that we should address. One. Two. We, we need to have, and I won't, I'm mature enough now that I won't f argue about whether it's a quote-unquote independent commission or an advisory uh, committee. Um, we need to actually do the things that are spelled out in the bill. And the bill is very, very detailed. We're very comfortable with what's, what's in the bill. It talks about um, supporting new programming. It talks about supporting existing programming without a punitive methods. For example, if we did an environmental scan and we say, well, agencies aren't doing A, B, C, and D, that doesn't mean we put them out of business. It means we work with them so that they can begin to do the things that we want to, to happen. It talks about um, um, doing annual reports so that we keep citizens can see how Pennsylvania is moving forward. There are a lot of things in the bill. I would keep all of those things that we have in the bill. That's the first thing. And I think that it's important to house it someplace that is not associated with programming, but it's a pro that is associated associated with advocating, and advocating for the forward movement of Pennsylvania. See, if you put it with programs, then you're stuck with federal laws and this and that and the other. But if we like I thought that one of the places that it might, I would be comfortable with it with the Joint State Government Commission, one. But let's say they say we don't want that. I'd be comfortable with the, uh, um, the Department of Community and Economic Development. Because, see, that's not, people don't feel bad about that. I mean, they don't feel that that means that it is for one group of people or another. It's generic. 
it's that that department, for example, is responsible for quote unquote the well being of Pennsylvania and its future. That makes sense. What you're saying is you want to see this out of welfare or entitlement. That's right? a, absolutely, absolutely. That's what we fought against all along. It's for everybody, and 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 it's not the same prescription for everybody. It's it's about. I often recently they, I get was talking to a group in Erie, and I said, Crawford County, which is next to Erie County. I said, and they're in one region. I said, you could have counties in the same region, but have a different approach to how they want to approach uh, and address the same issue. That's okay. What we're saying is, it's for everybody. It's for how do we engage fathers? How do we get them to, in my view, provide a platform and a way to support what they naturally want to do? You don't ever want to see some politician say, this is just some poverty problem of inner city Philadelphia. That's right. That costs taxpayers money. That's right. You, exactly. This exactly. Is That's it. Rufus, who were some of the important people that you worked with that were instrumental in getting the law passed and getting this point where we are now? Well, there were a number. And of course, I can't. There's so many, I can't say who they all are at this point for fear that I might miss someone. But there's, there's, there's a group of people that I think everybody would agree to. Uh, one is Senator, State Senator Anthony Hardy Williams, who was the first um, legislator to introduce in the Senate our original bill. The second person that I think is um, everyone would agree would be the actual final sponsor of the bill, State Representative Lori A. Mogorski out of Western Pennsylvania. Those two were key because there would be no law without someone introducing, moving the bill, advocating for the bill, et cetera. But I also uh, would recognize Speaker of the House of Representatives, Cutler, who made a commitment to the bill two years before it was passed. I would make, I would recognize the President Pro Temp who was, who, um, Corman in the Senate, who was also instrumental in the bill. Those are the legislative people I would mention. Clearly, I cannot not mention Pittsburgh the Fathers Collaborative Council and the AIU as service agencies that were committed to the bill. Then there, there are groups, Dr. Myers, who whenever we needed him to speak, a press conference, etc., was present and spoke. I don't think we mentioned the Dad's Resource Center, we just mentioned him. Yeah. But he, he founded his own nonprofit. He, right. No, we mentioned that. We, we mentioned, did. You did. Right. You we did. did. We did mention it. I want to mention it again. Right. You want to mention it again? It's fine. Um, and I think then I would call the collection of other people who are currently, who have been a part of this movement and continue now, in, now that we're in phase two, those people. And those, that new group of people will become the new heroes, if you will because they, they were supporters, followers, people who helped keep this conversation alive. Now that it is alive and moving, they now have moved up to leadership roles. So those are the people like Michael Flock, for example, in Chester County. Oh. Flock in, in, in Chester County, for example, or um, some of the other people. There are other people and, and that I don't want to get into all of them, not because they are not all worthy, but I'll forget somebody and we don't want to do that. But you will see these people. These are the new leaders moving forward, and they will be a part of, they will be the leadership of this new entity that's called SOC Commonwealth. Citizens Council. 
Rufus, what advice do you have for advocates and leaders who want to be catalysts and vehicles for social change? Well, I would say that um, it's hard work. It's work that um, it seems like there's never an ending. Um, sometimes we can be so naive when we think about making social change that, because uh, we were, I was, um, you know, I already said earlier that um, when we did the first conference, we thought that was it. I mean, we thought that was it. We banged our chest and said we did something and everybody felt good about it, but people wanted more. So it wasn't over. The bill now passed after three years or so of serious work. Now we realize, oh, it's not over. We now have to create something in addition. So what I would say is for advocates, you need someone or someone who have a commitment to what it, you're trying to achieve. And you need to reach out to as many possibilities of support as you can possibly get, period. Because you have to educate people about why this is as important as you do the work. And there are going to be many opportunities, many times when um, you're going to wonder to yourself, why am I doing this? And who really cares? And you have to decide, as I have decided, I don't ask myself that question anymore. I only ask myself, do I believe in that it, that is important? And it really gets down to the person who's doing it and why they're doing it. And I often have said to myself when I'm in the privacy of my home, I'm doing this because I believe it's important and I believe it's my contribution on this earth, period. I've done a lot of things. Why am I doing just this? I've done a lot of other things. How did I pick this? That goes back to my conversation, what I call my come to Jesus conversation about what I ought to be doing and what came out of that was this. And that's why I continue to do it. Whether I'm by myself or with others, I will continue to do it. In your official title, Rufus, founder and chair of the Strong Families, Families Commission. Commission. Yes. That's what I understood it to be. Rufus, let's leave it there. And I want to thank you for all that you've done with mm -hmm. this movement and for talking to me in front of a camera and recording this story for posterity. Thank you. Thank you.